Amazing Grace, possibly one of the most easily recognised Christian songs on the whole planet. And that's just what uh, this month's service is all about. Amazing Grace. It's such a wonderful picture of God's relationship with man through Jesus Christ. The hymn was written by John Newton and he'd was a man that had grown up on the sea and he was known for his profanity and for his coarseness. His mum, of course, wanted him to grow up and be a minister, but he rejected her teaching and instead became a slave trader. One day, Newton was trapped in a storm in the middle of the Atlantic and was certain that he was going to die. But he had an epiphany and remembered the words that his mother had taught him and his life began to be transformed. He didn't give up trading, slaving uh, immediately, but he realized that it wasn't compatible with his new faith. And eventually he became an ardent and tireless activist against slavery in England. And so when he became a minister, he would often write hymns to accompany his teaching. And one of those hymns was the one we've just heard. 
amazing grace. It's a heartfelt summation of what true grace looks like. This reading is taken from Luke 19, verses 1 to 10. Zacchaeus the tax collector. Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through. A man was there by the name of Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and was wealthy. He wanted to see who Jesus was, but being a short man, he could not because of the crowd. So he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore fig tree to see him, since Jesus was coming that way. When Jesus reached the spot, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, come down immediately. I must stay at your house today. So he came down at once and welcomed him gladly. All the people saw this and began to mutter, He has gone to be the guest of a sinner. But Zacchaeus stood up, and said to the Lord, Look, Lord, here and now I give half my possessions to the poor, and if I have cheated anybody out of anything, I will pay them back four times the amount. Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, because this man too is the son of Abraham, for the Son of Man came to seek and to save what was lost. Amen. Let's have a quick look at some of the biblical concepts of grace. Grace is something that's brimming from every single page of the Bible, and lots of these examples we can get from St Paul. In Colossians, Paul shows that grace is our way of speaking. He writes, let your speech be always gracious. Grace is also our whole Christian identity, isn't it? By the grace of God, I am what I am. It's how we anchor ourselves on how we live and how we act. But grace is deeper than that because it's about our holiness. God called us to a holy calling because of his own purpose and grace. And grace also gives us strength for living. It's our anchor, it's our holiness, it's our way of speech, it's our strength. It is good for the heart to be strengthened by grace, we read in Paul's letter to the Hebrews. And so the gospel is all about God's grace through Jesus. And that's why Paul calls it the gospel of the grace of God. And in Acts, he says the gospel is the word of his grace. Illustrations of God's direct grace, of grace working through God's people, are on every page of the Bible. And I suppose it's fitting then that the very last verse in Revelations, the last verse in the whole of Holy Scripture, is may the grace of the Lord be with you all. Our next hymn is one that you may remember from Sunday school days. It is so sweet to trust in Jesus. I've tried to find hymns for this recorded worship that are all completely different in style and contrast, but all which show the grace of God in different ways. This hymn was written by a lady called Louisa Steed and she'd moved to the States from Dover in England in about the 1870s. She and her husband had a, a daughter, Lily, and when Lily was about four, they went on a beach near New York for a picnic um, and her husband heard a small boy um, crying in panic in the sea and he rushed out to save the boy but in the boy's panic he pulled Louise's husband underwater and both the boy and her husband drowned. After that tragic event Louisa and her daughter moved to South Africa where she was a missionary for 15 or so years and it was during this time that she wrote the hymn, "'Tis So Sweet to Trust in Jesus." In the chorus of the hymn, she testifies uh, her trust in God. 
and then asks him to give her the grace to trust him more. There's wonderful beauty in that recognition that even our dedication, even our faith is given to us as an act of grace, of God's unmerited favour. Now a man named Lazarus was sick. He was from Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. This Mary, whose brother Lazarus now lay sick, was the same one who poured perfume on the Lord and wiped his feet with her hair. So the sisters sent word to Jesus, Lord, the one you love is sick. When he heard this, Jesus said, This sickness will not end in death. No, it is for God's glory, so that God's Son may be glorified through it. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So when he heard that Lazarus was sick, he stayed where he was two more days. And then he said to his disciples, let us go back to Judea. But Rabbi, they said, a short while ago the Jews there tried to stone you, and yet you're going back? Jesus answered, Are there not twelve hours of daylight? Anyone who walks in the daytime will not stumble, for they see by this world's light. It is when a person walks at night that they stumble. For they have no light. After he had said this, he went on to tell them, Our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I am going there to wake him up. 
His disciples replied, Lord, if he sleeps, he will get better. Jesus had been speaking of his death, but his disciples thought he meant natural sleep. So, then he told them plainly, Lazarus is dead, and for your sake I am glad I was not there, so that you may believe. But let us go to him. Then Thomas, also known as Didymus, said to the rest of the disciples, Let us also go, that we may die with him. On his arrival, Jesus found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days. Now Bethany was less than two miles from Jerusalem, and many Jews had come to Martha and Mary to comfort them in the loss of their brother. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went out to meet him, but Mary stayed at home. Lord, Martha said to Jesus, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But I know that even now God will give you whatever you ask. And Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha answered, I know he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live, even though they die. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Do you believe this? Yes, Lord, she said. I believe that you are the Messiah the Son of God, who is come into the world. After she said this, she went back and called her sister Mary aside. The teacher is here, she said, and he is asking for you. When Mary heard this, she got up quickly and went to him. Now Jesus had not yet entered the village, but was still at the place where Martha had met him. When the Jews, who had been with Mary in the house, comforting her, noticed how quickly she got up and went out, they followed her, supposing she was going to the tomb to mourn there. When Mary reached the place where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet and said, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping, and the Jews who had come along with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in spirit and troubled. Where have you laid him? he asked. Come and see, Lord, they replied. Jesus wept. Then the Jews said, See how he loved him. But some of them said, Could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man had kept this man from dying? Jesus, once more deeply moved, came to the tomb. It was a cave with a stone laid across the entrance. Take away the stone, he said. But Lord, said Martha, the sister of the dead man, by this time there is a bad odour, for he has been there four days. Then Jesus said, Did I not tell you that if you believe you will see the glory of God? So they took away the stone. Then Jesus looked up and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I said this for the benefit of the people standing here, that they may believe that you sent me. When he had said this, Jesus called in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The dead man came out his hands and feet wrapped with strips of linen and a cloth around his face. Jesus said to them, 
take off the grave clothes and let him go. Thanks be to God for the reading of his holy word. Amen. We have heard some of the biblical concepts of grace and we've had two wonderful examples of stories of God's grace playing out in, the, uh, in our scripture. So what do some of the clever people say about grace? There are some wonderful quotes and wonderful sayings around. E. Warfield said, grace is free sovereign favour to the ill-deserving. Grace is free sovereign favour to the ill-disturbing. And John Stott said some lovely words. He had described grace as being love that cares and stoops and rescues. And a man called Paul Zahl, I think he must have had teenagers because he said grace is unconditional love towards a person who does not deserve it. And there are many, many more, but I want to finish with... John Gresham Machen, who said, the very centre and core of the whole Bible is the doctrine of the grace of God. The very centre and core of the whole Bible is the doctrine of the grace of God. I suppose grace is most needed and best understood in the midst of sin and suffering and brokenness. Our world today is very much a world of earning, of deserving, of of merit, I suppose, and these result in judgment. And that is why everyone needs grace. Judgment kills and stops, but grace makes us alive. And of course, grace is not about us. Grace is a word about God. It's a word about his extravagant demonstrations of care and favour and love. Michael Horton once wrote, In grace, God gives nothing less than himself. This next hymn, Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing, I always think it, uh, it reminds me of some of those Old Testament Bible baddies come good. You know, people like Moses who... Who had those, done so many things wrong? Saul, David, oh goodness me, the list goes on, doesn't it? Of those who had started off bad and by the grace of God had transformed their lives. Well, this hymn was written by Robert Robinson and he was a handful when he was a child. He was born in 1735. He was a difficult child and his parents eventually shipped him off to London where he could take an apprenticeship with a barber at the age of 14. But the apprenticeship didn't go well and he continued being a bad boy. One day when he was about 17, he and some of his mates went uh, down into the town to hear George Whitefield, who was an evangelist. And the boys had gone with the intent to make mischief, to make fun. But actually what he heard that night hit him hard. It hounded him. And at the age of 20, by the grace of God, he gave his heart. He answered the call to ministry. And one day when he was preparing a sermon, he wrote the words, To come thou fount of every blessing.
Okay, so we've heard and seen some beautiful sayings about grace, both scriptural sayings and some from theologians. And I go back to that saying, the very centre and core of the whole Bible is the doctrine of the grace of God. What exactly is grace? What does this freely banded about Christian word tell us about our faith and our God? It's one of those terms that can become hugely overcomplicated, but I hope in my usual simpleton style, I hope not to make it complicated and I'll leave that to clever people. In my mind, grace can be described, it can be divided into two quite broad uses. Firstly, grace is a fact of God. It's a description of him, but more than that, it's, it's bigger than that. I suppose in the same way that we can describe God by using the word love, we can also say that God is love. We can describe God by using the word grace, and I suppose we can say God is grace. Throughout scripture, there are examples after examples of stories where God has shown, shown unfailing loving kindness towards people from all backgrounds and all situations. And the Bible readings that we've heard today are both stories of grace. Zacchaeus was a man who had done wrong. He cheated people. And Jesus singled him out and offered him salvation, offered him an opportunity to change. This is an act of grace. In our other story, Lazarus had been dead for four days. And when Jesus raised him, there were no conditions. He didn't ask Lazarus to declare his faith or to say if he wanted to be raised from the dead. Jesus just did it. An act of grace, not earned or even always deserved, but offered, because that's what God does. And as we look through the Bible and beyond the Bible, God's created people persistently show a lack of faith, a lack of love and a lack of all sorts of things, really. And God's response through his son, through his Holy Spirit, is relentless. It's merciful. It's a perennial act of self-giving love, forgiveness, patience, understanding, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. You heard those words before? Yes, the fruits of the Spirit are all acts of grace. And one of the questions that we as Christians ask each other and ourselves is the seeming difference in God between the Old and the New Testament. Someone, I think it was a teenager, uh, when asked once about the Old and New Testament, said that uh, the New Testament shows what God was like after he became a Christian. It's very easy only to see an angry, wrathful, vengeful God in the Old Testament laws, but grace is as present before Jesus as through him. Grace has been described as being unmerited favour, shown to unworthy men and women. And that's woven through the Old Testament. God was bitterly disappointed, wasn't he, with the humans he created. But take the example of Noah. Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord, and he was saved, quite literally. Moses, he was an arrogant, stubborn, doubtful man, and he asked God to use someone else on more than one occasion. But God stuck with him. A man who had killed another man with his bare hands, stuck by him and walked with him. That's grace. David, he'd lied, he'd killed, and he'd behaved very badly towards women. Yet God saw into his heart and he blessed him greatly. God's grace saw through David's flaws. And as a result, David became a man so full of the love of God that his psalms have given hope and comfort for thousands of years. 
In the Anglican Church, before uh, a priest prepares the bread and wine, we wash our hands in a symbolic gesture and we utter the words, wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sins. Those words from Psalm 51, penned by David, have become an act of humility, asking for God's grace before we help others to be spiritually fed. The Bible is packed with examples of humans who sin and a God who forgives. Humans who run and a God who pursues. Humans who don't deserve grace and a God who gives it anyway. I'm not going to press stop, but I am going to pause because the kitten is trying to suckle the dog. It only happens in my house. If you have ever felt unworthy of God's grace, just spend some time flicking through the Old Testament. God's grace is unavoidable and the mistakes made by many of those people make some of our mistakes seem quite lame. You'll soon discover that no one is worthy of God's grace. Not Noah, not Abraham, not Joseph, not Moses, not the Israelites, nor Rahab, nor David, not me, not you, but we still get it. Freely given, because God is grace.
unending love, amazing grace. So far we have concentrated on the first use of the word grace, which tells us something about the nature of God in Christian teaching, which tells us indeed that God is grace. The second basic use of the word grace is intrinsically linked to the first, and in fact it's kind of an extension of the first, because it's the way that grace is used to describe the particular gifts of God that enable us as humans to do something quite extraordinary. If we were left to our own devices, we wouldn't be quite so smart, would we? We wouldn't be able to achieve all that we can. We're good at lots of things as humans, but we can achieve so much more with the grace of God. A simple example of this is loving. Anyone who knows what it is to love can recognise an ability in themselves which is really quite extraordinary. To give of oneself without condition, without concern for anything other than the well-being and the happiness of uh, the recipient of our love is really quite extraordinary. Christianity teaches us that we have a, a gap between being a human and our divine potential. And that gap is bridged by the grace of God. So here we are, human being. Here we are, human being reaching divine potential. And that's quite something. And in the middle, is this bridge and this bridge is grace. So I'm going to talk less now, in fact I'm going to stop talking and I'll put on a piece of music for us to reflect to and I want you to use this time for your prayers of intercession rather than me leading them and I want you to think about grace in your life. Think about the gifts that you have, the things that you have been able to do, which actually you've been able to do with Cyber's Divine, with the divine potential that you can have. The things that you've done by the grace of God. Spend some time giving thanks for those things and asking God to make you aware of that bridge and think of when other people have helped you, have loved you because of the grace that they have been gifted in a myriad of ways. If the music finishes before your thoughts and prayers are finished then press pause and spend more time, more blessed time with God.
I have recorded this final hymn probably about 4,963 times. I've tr tried to get four parts in, but every time I record another part, it distorts the sound quality. So what you've got is the best that I can do with my many, many attempts at recording this hymn. And I've made many attempts because this hymn, All Hail the Power of Jesus' Name, has often been called the National Anthem of Christendom. It was written by um, a man called Edward Perronet. Now, I like him. He was an Anglican, but he passionately served Methodism. It's been sung with many, many different tunes over the life of every denomination that there is. Perronet was a strong speaker, but he was one of those people who would use less words sometimes and make them powerful. He was well known for standing up one day and saying, I'm going to now preach the best sermon that has ever been preached. And then he read the Sermon on the Mount. And he had similar thoughts with this hymn. When he wrote the words to this hymn, he declared that he had then said everything that he wanted to say. So let's crown him Lord of all. to us in the things of this world. Bless your eyes and be in your seeing. May Christ, who looks upon you with deepest love, bless your eyes and widen your gaze. May the Spirit, 
who perceives what is and what yet may be, bless your eyes and sharpen your vision. May the sacred three bless your eyes and cause you by grace to see. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit be with you all and those whom you love and pray for today and always. Amen. So